welcome. My name is James Kerwin. I'm Assistant Director of the Program on Negotiation. I'm really thrilled to have such a large crowd and also to have Professor Hirsch, uh, Dr. Hirschfeld with us, as well as Professor Mnookin of the Harvard Law School and Professor Sabanius of the Harvard Business School. We are taping this, so it will also be available on the web later. Um, but again, thank you. I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Robert Mnookin. Uh, well, it's my great pleasure uh, to uh, introduce you <coughs> to uh, Yair Hirschfeld. Yair is a great man, and uh, uh, I, I, I cannot exaggerate how much I admire him. Uh, literally, for decades, he has devoted his considerable intellectual, analytical, and personal talents to the process of speech. After this session, you're going to have an opportunity, I hope, uh, to, if you're interested, uh, to buy his book, which I uh, dipped into again this morning. I had seen portions of it earlier as a draft. It is a monumental and superb book that, in terms of the sweep and the history of uh, various efforts towards peace in the Middle East, is just going to turn out to be indispensable reading. Uh, it is sophisticated. He has a deep understanding of the various dilemmas of negotiations. He knows all the major players who have been involved over time. And it is our great uh, privilege uh, to have him here. He's also been a great friend uh, to uh, the program on negotiation and various efforts we've made with respect uh, to the promotion of uh, peace in the Middle East. Uh, indeed, uh, he really helped me think through, although he was not a direct participant, uh, something I did a decade ago relating to the settlements uh, and the internal conflicts within Israel. And I will be forever indebted to him uh, uh, for his help in that regard. Uh, well, uh, without more to do, uh, uh, let me uh, uh, simply uh, turn things over to him. Uh, he is, uh, he presently has, holds a number of positions, probably the most central of which is the Director General of the Tel Aviv-based Economic Cooperation Foundation, also known as the ECF, which is really a think tank devoted to uh, the promotion uh, of peace. Uh, he regularly teaches and lectures here in the United States, and on behalf of PON and my colleague Jim, uh, we're thrilled you're here. Uh, we're going to proceed as follows. Uh, he's going to talk for 15 or 20 minutes. By 12.30, he's going to, he promises he will end his uh, lecture. Uh, Jim and I will then ask him probably a series of questions, and then we'll finally open it up uh, to questions uh, from the audience. Thanks. Uh, here. Uh, good morning or good noon to everybody. Many thanks for having me. Many thanks to you. Many thanks to you. It's a pleasure being here. Um, I got the, uh, the guidance to speak about um, negotiations in the past, in the present, and in the future. I'll do more about the past, but I'll get a little bit into the present and the future. Now, um, if you look at the theoretical part of ne negotiations, you have to divide them into four or five chronological parts, what we call the pre-pre um, negotiations when there has to be track two, the people don't speak to each other, and you want to know whether it makes sense to speak to each other. And you have to read Professor Minukin's book to know whether to kill the other side or to speak. <laughs> and <laughs> he can tell you far more about that than me. Um, but it is a track two exercise that has to prepare um, the next phase, which is the preliminary negotiations. The preliminary negotiations is where they both sides have actually decided to speak to each other, but you have to create a frame in order to know how to do it. Um, this was the Oslo negotiations. This is actually not track two negotiations, but it is a back-channel negotiating effort, and I'll speak a little bit more about that. Now, if the back-channel negotiating effort succeeds, it leads to official negotiations, which in our case was, I started the back, the kind of back-channel negotiations went on for far longer time than is known, but the official negotiations with the PLO started on May 20, 1993, and this is then actually secret negotiations 
where you have to finalize the agreement, but you don't have the public legitimacy. And then you have to go for the first, fourth part, which is actually seeing how do you legitimize the agreement and make it public. And then comes the ratification by the parliament and, um, and the implementation, which is probably the most important part. And negotiators often forget the importance <laughs> to look at how do you present what you've agreed upon to the public and how do you take care of implementation. If you look at the Irish negotiations, the Friday agreement was signed in April 1998, but the real negotiations and implementation um, happened far later. And we have similar difficulties in this context. Mm. Now, quickly about the Track 2 negotiations. Um, what you need um, is open access to the leadership, a free flow of information, a sense of humility that you do not impose on the other side, um, that you have an understanding what is achievable. You find the zone of possible agreement. In order to find the possible zone of possible agreement, we would always look at what I call a six-point test. And I would advise to adopt this as it's not a bad way. The first point that you have to look at is how do you, can you create a common ground between the narratives of both sides. And you need the narrative as a leading issue in order to see that you could put things together. The second issue you have to look at is where do the national, the national interests merge and how can you feed on that. The third one is um, what um, Professor Minukin also is related to very much, is what we call behind the table negotiations. Um, this is the internal constitutional structural setup inside. The fourth issue, and I'm running on time, um, the fourth issue is the um, institutional setup. On the Israeli side, how does the Mossad relate to it? How does the IDF relate to it? How does the Treasury relate to it? You may have a difficulty in the United States between the um, Department of Defense and the State, State Department and maybe the Treasury. Um, this institutional setup is the um, the fourth issue. Um, the fifth issue is obviously the, ta the task of the leadership. How are the leaders capable of doing things? And the sixth issue is, should not be missed is lessons learned and how do you learn from former failures how to move ahead. And if you, if you adapt this six point, six point test, you can define in track two in back channel and in other negotiations Actually, to the, it helps you to define how has the zone of possible agreement. And if you don't have the six-point test, you do what, you, what your heart wants. And what your heart wants is often very good and lovely, but it is often the best way, with the, it is often the recipe to have turned the best intentions to a way to, is the best way to the way to hell or to disaster. So you should take care of that. Now, if I move quickly to back-channel negotiations, what we did is um, uh, I, I had free access to Simon Perez and via Simon Perez to Rabin. Um, the um, normal negotiations um, have the, the, ne the official negotiations have very serious shortcomings. Um, and the shortcomings are mainly that um, the negotiators are totally bound to the, uh, to the um, directives that they get from the um, leadership. We were free or we could invent things and play off matters. You have to be totally deniable. The back channel negotiations can only work if you're totally deniable. And actually, we, c we maintain total deniability, deniability. And if you read the books of Abu Mazen of, and of Abu Allah, um, I irritated them most effectively in Oslo, because I maintained the total deniability and said, well, I'm only speaking for myself. And if you ask me, ask on how do you create the sense that you are totally deniable and you only speak Yai Hirschfeld and Ron Pundak, um, but you are taken serious by the other side, we had a trick to do it, but I'll keep you, um, uh, I will tell you if you ask me. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> they are later on. And uh, no, quickly, quickly, um, what we did is that we had, um, um, for every meeting in Norway, I, we asked Shimon Peres to have a meeting with Faisal Hussein and Hanan Mashraoui. We looked that the protocol would have our names there. And um, we knew that this protocol would go to Tunis. 
And what happened in Norway, and if you read the book, it's a clear description of it. In Norway, there was often a replica of the talk Paris had with Hanan Ashraoui and Faisal Husseini, because Abu Allah would give us part of the text that Paris said, and I would give him part of the, ta of the text that Faisal Husseini said. So they knew we were relevant to function. It wasn't too difficult. Uh, now, uh, in any negotiations, um, there are three major difficulties that I believe back-channel negotiations can solve. Um, the first difficulty is, um, at the beginning, um, you have to make it clear that you're damn serious in getting to an agreement. Um, but you don't want to give all cards away. And in back-channel negotiations, it's very easy to say. I said, I tell the Palestinians, I believe, I, I, I'm the goody. I believe you can get this and this and that. But I, by actually saying the, the optimal that I believe is possible, I'm also doing the red lines. And the difficulty in normal negotiations is how do you say you're very serious, but at the same time, you're putting the red lines on the table. Because the red lines have to be very clear, and if there are no real clear red lines at the beginning, you're going to <laughs> go down in the thing, because then they'll push you more and more, and then you don't know how to stop. It happened to Mr. Barak in a way which I don't want to, the book describes. Um, uh, so you have to have this deal with this dilemma. And this is relatively easy in the back channel negotiations, because in back channel negotiations, you say that you're serious. But by saying what you're serious, you say, this is what I think you can get. I'm sure if you want to get the OK of Yossi Berlin, you'll have to give some more con concessions, and for Paris a little bit more, and for Rabin even more. So I'm telling you the, the maximum. You have to get the optimum for you. So I'm actually putting down that we are serious, but there are also red lines. And um, you have also to make, take the, make the red lines very clear. And you can make them clear in back channel negotiations. And you also can move forward in, um, in leaving something for the leader to take care afterwards, because you speak and you have an idea how to do it. Now, I, in the, in the, first, on, on the first or second the first meeting, I gave four lines to Abu Allah. And I believe they're decisive for back channel negotiations. And the four lines said, um, fact finding, see if there's place for an agreement. Second, partial authorization. And partial authorization was extremely important. And the third meeting in Norway, I got from Shimon Peres, the question, I was asked to ask the question, Mr. Arafat, when are you interested to come to Gaza? Now, this was a deal maker. In, um, if you want to negotiate, one of the most important issues you have to take care of is to make the other side the demandeur. The other, the, the other side wants it. To offer Arafat to go back to Gaza to, to, turned the Palestinians into demandeur. And I don't want to say that from that moment I had them in my hand, but from that moment Abu Allah had to deliver the goods. So the second was partial authorization. The third one was legitimization. I asked them to do a lot of things and to prove that they were serious. I can go you through the things. It was basically restarting the Washington negotiations, taking Faisal Husseini there, giving other concessions that were very, very important. But they had, I would ask them, because they were the demandeurs, they had to legitimize it and to make it clear that I could go to Paris and Rabin and say, let's do it. And the fourth one is breakthrough, which is a very difficult thing for any back channel negotiator. Because um, the officials take over, and you are from being the main issue and the chief negotiator, you can't go to the back seat, and you have to get your ego a little bit down. Um, but um, I believe these are guidelines that you can use in, in doing it. In the, um, in the negotiations, um, in that, I would say the most important part in Israeli-Palestinian negotiations is um, a two story I tell in the book, um, and um, it describes um, a story of Rabin and the sim of Arafat. Um, uh, Rabin didn't give, after we finished the DOP, the um, generals came in and negotiated with Uri Savia on top of them, and, um, uh, and he didn't give directives what the strategic outcome was. And there was some thinking behind it. And the story I, that was told to me when I researched for the book was that Danny Rothschild, who was in charge of Palestinian affairs for Rabin, um, told me the following story. 
that um, Rabin, um, Rabin um, would go to meet Arafat and ask for confidence building measures. And uh, Rothschild gave him twen 20 and said, give him six, wait for six, wait until he answers, and then give him another six and keep another 12 for yourself. They came to, they came to Ares, and in Ares, um, they, um, in Ares, um, Rabin went upstairs and they were for five minutes. Um, he sat alone for six minutes. After six minutes, he called Danny Rothschild and came up. He sat beside him and said, Danny, I gave him all the 20 confidence building measures. Give me 10 more. <laughs> <laughs> well, what Rabin was saying, I want to develop a path. I don't actually know exactly what I'm going to, what is going to the outcome. But I want to de develop a partnership with the other side. And the partnership is the important thing. I have to build trust. It is not an everything or nothing issue. It is what, what we can manage politically together. We have to manage politically together. We have to create enough of, enough of understanding that we can do that. Um, and the second story is Arafat. Um, we worked in Belin Abu Mazen, which is a permanent status concept that solves all outstanding issues. And um, before we actually finished it in the 31st of October 1995, Arafat told me in a meeting, Yair, don't go for a full agreement. Don't. The gap is too big. Let's see what can be done. and don't go for a thing. And if you want a lesson, a basic lesson for Mr. Kerry, for President Obama, um, for whoever negotiates tomorrow, um, if the issue is that you want to have a full agreement and solve all core issues, you will not be able to go there. And we actually told this beforehand. The real issue, the real issue at hand is, um, let's see, um, um, uh, let's not have what is, nothing is agreed upon until everything is agreed upon, but what can be agreed upon shall be implemented. Now, um, if I speak about the present negotiations, the present negotiations have been, um, um, we've made, we have had one failure after the other. Now, if I'm in a very optimistic mood, I will tell you that the success we had in Oslo was the outcome of six or seven failures. And the failures helped us to understand where the, the difficulties were. And the failures were a basic precondition for success. Now, failure can be a precondition for success. Failure can be also a um, prelude to disaster. And I can't tell you if we are going from a prelude, uh, if we are going, this is what we have now as a prelude to disaster, or um, if there are conditions for, uh, for success. I can tell you what I believe conditions for success could be. If we go from the present to the future, I'm keeping my time. Um, if you go from the present to the future, um, there is um, today, uh, after the Gaza war, um, a situation where there's a big opportunity and a greater danger. Um, the danger will be that business, um, there will be business as usual. And if there's business as usual, you will have the Palestinian Authority going down the drain in, I don't know, two years, three years, eight months, three and a half years. It's very difficult to tell the time, but there's an erosion of power. And if the PA goes down the, the, the drain um, and settlements continue, the likelihood of a two-state solution is going to get slimmer and slimmer. And the likelihood of a Somalia-like situation in Gaza and in our area is getting to big, big and bigger. And this danger is obviously very, very evident, and we have to take care of it. If I take to look at the good side of the developments, the logic of the Gaza war means that it is in major interest of Israel, Egypt, the Palestinian Authority, to, to prevent the rearming of Hamas. There's a major security interest of Israel to work together with Egypt, the Palestinian Authority, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, <coughs> Jordan, the Arab League, against the terror ring around us, against Qatar, against Turkey, against ISIS, against all the Jabhat al-Nusra and all of this. Now, this will be only possible 
This will be only possible if we move ahead uh, on the peace process. Now, on the peace process, one more move. I heard that um, Secretary of State Schulz has said recently, did I hear from you? Um, uh, the CC, you have no idea what you can achieve if you don't have formally to agree upon it. Um, so Mayor Dagan, who was the head of al Mossad, said, let's move ahead with understanding with the Palestinians where we move one or the other without signing an agreement. Maybe we have to sign agreements. Maybe we have to form. But there's a lot of capability to move forward, from my point of view, in a two-phase approach. Phase number one is look seriously and for state building issues in the West Bank. Expand substantially the power of the Palestinian Authority, the areas they control, the, uh, the services they can give on the West Bank and in different countries in Gaza. Have a real state building effort as a, as a corridor towards the second phase, which we can already speak about, is to look at the, um, the core issues of conflict. But have not the core issues, don't solve the core issues of conflict now, we cannot do that. But have an understanding how you reach there and how you do that. Uh, if we take this um, and we look at the six point uh, test that I spoke about, I think we have a chance of building, building a better future for Israelis, Palestinians, and the area. Thanks. Jim, why don't you? Two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Yair, it's such a pleasure to have you here and to, for people to sense what's behind a quick delivery, but each of those sentences has a lot of depth. And those of us who've known you for a little bit and benefited from your friendship and your analysis and your generosity in introducing those of us who are new to the region in the last several years. Um, we really appreciate it. You should get major credit and do among anyone who knows for the architecture of the Oslo process. And yet, it's almost received wisdom among many people that, quote, Oslo failed, unquote. How do you react to that? <coughs> No, yeah, um, I wasn't part of the implementation. <laughs> uh, it's more complicated than that. <laughs> uh, I'll say something to my. Um, I've concluded. Um, the first agreement that never became, never happened was that in March 1993, um, Abu Ali and I had an agreed upon paper. And Paris threw me out of the Knesset for it. I got a terrible beating for it. And it had um, two made, there were two major differences that were changed. And to my defense, I will say, uh, maybe I'm not objective, but I was right and he was wrong. Uh, <laughs> Um, what I said, uh, what I said was, you need to have to um, permit Arafat to negotiate from an interim to a permanent status agreement. But to establish the Palestinian Authority, let's have a trusteeship, have the international international people that they would have. We were uh, attacked. Why did you give them guns? We could have given the guns to the trusteeship, um, and we could have. They would have prevented corruption. They would have built a serious state structure with the Palestinians together. And Paris threw me out of the, of the thing. And afterwards, he wrote his own autobiography, The Battle for Peace. And it was extremely fair to me. And he explains why I proposed the trusteeship. And he says, I, was, I Paris, was against the trusteeship because I was, I, will, I was sure, which he was right, that this would lead to a Palestinian state. And he was against the Palestinian state. So I may have been right on that. And the second one is um, I, had, um, I had learned from the Schultz Initiative um, that the Schultz Initiative was intellectually brilliant, um, said that let's negotiate for interim. 
but in the same time prepare for in the same time prepare for for per, for the permanent status issue in stapling other issues and make it not necessary to have a final interim agreement a final self government agreement and um, Rabin in, insisted on the final self government agreement which created enormous tension so um so part of it is we could have it could have been architectured better if you're a back channel negotiator take two negotiator and the decision making is not with you you better accept what they tell you and you are not even if you think you're right and i must say i didn't fight for it um no the the essence of um um i believe the real failure the, there were many failures there were um i can go into this very much um but the real failure um was that the paradigm was and the paradigm was laid down in 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 the Camp David Accords in 1978 the paradigm was negotiations self government solve the core issues of conflict and then have a state now i believe this is a totally wrong paradigm you have to have negotiations self government the state in coming and then substantial state building substantial development of trust and social capital bottom up middle out and top down understandings and only after you've done it you can go to deal with the core issues and this is from my point of view the major then then there were a lot of other details in this one of the things you said that i think would catch the attention of a number of people here especially interested in negotiation we tend to focus on interests what does each side really care about and how can you creatively reconcile those interests and you started some place else you said you need to somehow find common ground with the narratives and i'd like you to talk more about that because i think many people would say narratives are important to acknowledge to respect but they're usually irreconcilable and in that sense what did you mean and how does one do this as a practical matter beyond acknowledgement and and respect um the narrative we had in oslo was um um let's look at win-win issues and there is a win-win situation um and um so this wasn't the palestinian narrative the israeli narrative it was a joint narrative it was a joint narrative you're narrative. building about the negotiations you're building a joint narrative about the negotiation so, so by narrative what you really mean is what is going to be the story we're going to each tell to our people about why we're doing this now not sort of what what our description of the past is no but i mean a little bit more um if you speak about jerusalem if you say jerusalem the jews had never anything to do with jerusalem or we say the palestine islam was never thing you have very contradictory uh, narratives if you say we most imagine jerusalem as a city of peace you have a coordinated narrative um if um uh, you you have to but you have to deal with the narrative um you on um on security um it cannot be unilateral security it has to be bilateral mutual regional security um that things like this but you i need to look at the narratives not only of what you can do but also what you cannot do because on now now for instance now if you look at the um a part of the disaster of 2000 of the negotiations in 2000 is not that the old narratives are of uh, the new narratives are, are terribly apart the israeli side believes and i say it i use the word is that the, the palestinians started the intifada al aqsa against the peace government and i can sustain this totally and i write in the book why 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 i have all the 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 evidence that this is the case the palestinian narrative is that they were tricked um the palestinians were tricked in negotiations by barack um and there was um, no effort to come and f- feed into their needs and there was an effort to impose a peace concept on from then and if you read my book i can sustain that argument too but this dividing narrative of the 2000 negotiations has become a major difficulty major difficulty in um 
in moving forward. And what I'm saying is, in order to go back to the more substantial negotiations, we have first to create a narrative that we're working together. And I think we can do that. So that if we can say we're working together on Palestinian state building, we're working together, there's a lot of things, and then, then, then we can go beyond it. But if these, the narratives are too wide apart, it's very difficult okay, to but go. I, but I think what, what I, I just want to underscore, and I think it relates to what Jim said, uh, by narrative, you mean the story we're going to tell now yeah. about why we're doing what we're doing now. And, and I mean that you have to be aware of the, of the difficulties of the political leadership to, to push aside the old narratives that are very no, but, but I think what you're saying, and I, I just want to underscore it because I think it's terribly important, uh, you know, for example, there's, there's a professor at BU uh, whose view is that the effort should be to create a common historical narrative of, for example, what happened in 1948. And many uh, mediators uh, say, uh, whether it's with a divorcing couple or two companies or whatever, to try to construct a single history that they're going to both agree to is a fool's errand and that will, in fact, often polarize the people. What you should instead do is look to the future and think about what their interests are in the future. Now, I heard what Jim heard. It sounded like you were saying, oh, I think a precondition is you better think of your narrative and create a common narrative. And what I now understand is, yes, but you're not saying let's create a common story about what happened in 1948 or uh, why uh, 2000 failed. You're saying what you have to do is figure out the common story that you're going to take to the public now, <coughs> to the constituents on each side, about why you're doing now what you're doing and why there's hope and what the leader's problems are, et cetera. It's 80%. Okay. It's 80%. I, I'm it's not 80%. sure what the other 20% is. I'll Just tell you. negotiating with you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 the, uh, I'll tell you, there, there is a recent book by um, Khalil Shikaki, Abdul Muni, Ali Said, and Shai Feldman. And yeah. they have, they, I believe it's a breakthrough. I believe it's of enormous importance, the book. Um, it does... It does create a joint narrative. That's right, a portion of it. A portion of it, right. but it also creates the recognition of one side of the other of the narrative of the other right. side. Um, it is easier to deal with the refugee issue if we Israelis recognize that there is a Palestinian narrative of 1948 that Absolutely. we have to deal with. Right. Okay, no, so we have see, agreement on the 100%. No, no, no but, and, uh, well, <laughs> I, but I think what that book, which is a very interesting yeah. book, does is they have I'm going to use some, uh, a lawyer's jargon. A portion of their, of each chapter is an agreed statement yes. about what happened, mm -hmm. and it's sort of an agreed statement of facts. But then other portions are, here's my perspective uh, uh, on, on that, and here's another, there are three different perspectives. But, and what you're saying is, seeing if you can agree on some basics as to the past, that's the 20% yes. that can be valued. It's probably yeah. worth for people unfamiliar with this effort. It's a, it's a book by, each, by, by three prominent authors, a Palestinian, an Israeli, and an Egyptian, Egyptian. all serious players in their, own, in their own rights, to write a common story of the, uh, to write a, a common history and analysis of, of peacemaking in the Middle East. And so co-authorship would be too, too too gentle a term for what was an, a deep intellectual negotiation over not what where we can compromise, but where we can actually find agreement and where we can't on what happened. And then where we differ, each other's narratives. And it's really, it's, it's a book that takes some doing to read, but it came out. And I think it's a landmark. There are very few things like that. And I, it's uh, together with your book. I think those are, those are very useful. Could I ask a, another question? Then, Bob, we may turn to areas that, that you'd like to focus. It is, Sorry? the name of it is, I think it's called the Arab-Israeli conflict. No, Arabs and Israelis. Arabs and Israelis. The, uh, I'm sure we can post this on the, uh, on the PON website. 
So uh, we because it's it's well worth it. Shai yeah. Feldman, Kalaki, Khalil Sikaki. Khalil Sikaki. He's in here now, just now. Yeah. He spends part of every year at Brandeis in mm -hmm. Shai's center. He's a wonderful pollster of uh, both both um, Palestinians in the territories and the diaspora. It's quite interesting stuff. Anyhow, the, uh, let me cut to one of the core contentions that I hear you make out of your experience. And that's that all these efforts over the years, for various reasons, to do a full deal. And I think of Henry Kissinger toward the end of the 90s, in op-ed after op-ed saying, we tried step by step in Oslo, confidence building and what have you. All it did was open the door to spoilers on both sides and externally. And we've explored the issues enough. It's time to do a full deal. And we heard a version of that, obviously, with, from President Clinton at the time, Barack. We heard a version of it from John Kerry most recently. And the argument would be, in an ideal world, you could build confidence and go step by step and slowly. And yet, is there the time and is there the capacity to, uh, to, to do that on the sides before spoilers essentially can derail the process? And I wonder if you could speak to that issue. No, yeah, I have a very strong opinion on that. That's why I asked. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, um, empirically, we tried to have a permanent status in 95, we tried in 2000. We tried in 2001 once more after um, Camp David worked down in Taba. Um, we tried Olmert and we tried now Kerry. Um, now, if you ever have heard about Albert Einstein uh, saying, um, if you have an experience doesn't work one time, twice, three times, and you do it the sixth and the seventh time, this is insanity. Um, so um, uh, I understand the logic. Um, but it has a second part to the logic, um, though um, maybe it is difficult to do it step by step, um, but it doesn't mean it is possible to do it at one step. Um, well, I'm very, very quite clear on that. Now, the reason why it is so impossible to do it in one step is that on most of the major issues, it is a zero-sum gain solution necessary. And before you don't create a nut of substantial support and you create enough of substantial safety networks, it is very difficult to go to the zero-sum game issues. And I don't think it's no coincidence that it's failed again and again. <coughs> uh, let me ask a, a, a specific question. <coughs> Among the failures, of course, was uh, 2000, Camp David and Taba. And what's interesting in your book, uh, you describe uh, how before the parties convened at Camp David, uh, Arafat uh, met with uh, President Clinton. And how, with the benefit of hindsight, you think Clinton, and you said you did as well, everybody misread Arafat and thought there was a, a, what you call a Zopa, a zone of possible agreement with the Palestinians, where in fact, if they had listened more carefully to Arafat, they'd realize that the time was not ripe. Maybe I'm mischaracterizing uh, what you said, but that's my impression. Uh, no, yeah, you, um, <laughs> you, you are reading what I thought on the 20th of April until the 30th of April. Uh, on the 10th of June, uh, I know the dates by heart. Um, it's all the, in year 2000. It's all, all, all in 2000. On the 20th of April, there was a meeting between President Clinton and Chairman Arafat. And, um, and there was a beginning when we thought we can, that Arafat's quite um, de demands were tactical, not strategic. And it looked like maybe we can move things together. On the 10th of June, I had worked for 20 years with Yossi Belin. I never, never put down a protocol on it. On the 10th of June, I had a phone call with Yossi Belin, and I wrote a protocol of the phone call. And 
I didn't remember it, but then looked into my documents. And if I read the document and I know myself, I was shouting at Yossi Berlin. I was shouting at him and I said, Yossi, if we are going to go to Camp David and you're going to go along the line Barak wants to go on a full agreement, this is going to be violence. And they're telling us. It's not that it's something that I'm inventing. It is. It cannot be everything or nothing. We have to be lost. And Yossi Berlin told me, uh, no, 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 but write something. And I wrote two papers for Barack. I never got an answer. And um, then um, two weeks later, I convinced Nimrod Novik that I was right. And Nimrod Novik wrote a, um, the same paper, better and nicer, as Corridor to Peace for Barack. He sent it by fax to Barack at home. And after five minutes, he got a phone call of Barack hysterically shouting at him. Um, Nimrod, I've figured it all out. I know how to get Arafat to the corner. I know how to do it. And you're opening a sedek. You're opening a, um, a crack. You're opening a crack. And I prohibit you to do anything with it. And Nimrod said, and what will happen if Arafat will say no to you? No, he cannot say no. And by the 11th of July, when they went to Camp David, um, Yossi Berlin was convinced that we were right. <laughs> and he... Uh, um, he put a f plan B into an envelope and handed it to Barack and said, Eot, if things go wrong in King David, please open the envelope and look at it. And things went terribly wrong in King David. And Barack came back and handed him the envelope, closed, not opened. So in, in other words, uh, very early on in June, you were persuaded Thank you. Uh, you were persuaded. That you were persuaded that all or nothing, trying to reach a conclusion on all the final status issues, uh, was a was impossible, uh, and that it would be far better to aim for some partial agreements. But Barack, and I think President Clinton as well, both probably were driven in part by a sense that our days in power may be numbered. And afterwards, the world breaks down. The United States stops to exist. <laughs> right. No, and, and that I want, uh, I, I want credit for an enormous historical achievement. OK. Um, uh, but uh, in all events, um, say more about which issues in particular you thought it would be wrong to press on. Uh, all the final status issues, or particularly the refugee issues, or that, you know, it, it's, it, given what happened at Taba afterwards, not so much with Arafat, but in fact, there was a fair degree of closure. Uh, I, what, I, what, do you, what do you think, what, what, what at the time did you think was just going to be impossible? I knew what was, I, I, you know, I'm an historian. And what I will say in the next two sentences is every historian will kill me. Um, but I know there was a deal possible on another issue. And um, I will give you two indications. Um, Arafat, Arafat proposed at Camp David and later on by Hanan Ashrawi to me and by me to Barak. And then he did it directly to Barak. He wanted to give me 51% of the territory, to go from 41 to 51. Give, let me have municipal elections in Jerusalem and um, some other smaller things and go for two, two more years for negotiations. And maybe let me establish a state or even yes or not. It wasn't the main issue. The main issue was 51% and the municipal elections in Jerusalem, which would have established the Palestinian um, presence in, in Al-Quds. Now, every normal government would go on the knees to say this is what we want today. Um, now, this is one thing that Arafat actually proposed, and I, w I, I got wired to me. I was told to say no to the thing, so that wasn't accepted. There was something else. There was a um, former settler, um, chief of the settler, um, secretary of the settler union, Otniel Schneller, who, um, who, prepared, who prepared with Tarifi 
um, the, the um, civilian portfolio, the state-to-state -state relations. And I know exactly what he prepared. If we have taken Arafat's proposal and Otniel Schneller Tarifi's proposal together, we would have a perfect agreement. And Clinton and Barack simply passed it up because of their, their thing. And Clinton, to be honest, Clinton in his autobiography writes at the end, um, Arafat told him, so we love you so much, and he said, no, I was a failure, and you, Mr. Arafat, made me a failure. And the truth is, it was mutual. Now, let me ask another question, which really also relates to uh, uh, President Clinton and Camp David. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, Clinton uh, suggested what are now often characterized as the Clinton parameters. Mm -hmm. And they are uh, essentially uh, a basic framework for the resolution of the final status issues. And uh, part of the conventional wisdom ever since, indeed in your book, uh, you acknowledge that it's genuinely accurate, is that the paradox of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in some ways is that most sophisticated folks on both sides realize that there's a deal for the final status issues that would largely satisfy a majority on each side. And you could, we could all identify the, the core terms. Uh, Jim and I have been involved in some track two processes with Israelis and Palestinians where what we did is we spelled it out in advance and we said, there's going to be no debate about these. We want you to assume this much. And now let's talk <coughs> about a lot of issues having to do with implementation and other, other things. Now, I guess my question is, do you still believe that Roughly speaking, uh, those parameters uh, uh, exist. Uh, and uh, say a little more, because we've all written and thought about this. Why is it that it's possible here to identify the basic framework on the one hand, and yet negotiations fail over and over and over and over again? Those are two questions. One question is, do you still believe, basically, in the Clinton parameters? Not, the, not as a process, but as a set of goals. I believe the Clinton parameters are an important component. I believe there's some other components necessary. As well? Yes. What are the other components? Um, um, the, um, uh, uh, um, uh, you need a more serious um, by in, I don't know if this is the right English word, um, you need a more serious involvement, empowerment of the um, religious leadership on both sides. The religious leadership. The yeah. religious Jewish and the religious Islamic leadership on both sides. And they have to be part of, they have to feel uh, empowered and not being alienated um, by, by the entire system. And I think the work you did was extremely important but I will be discussed with you in this afternoon or tomorrow how to take it one step further. And we are discussing with rabbis how to take this one step further. And while we leave, we have to do this with the Islamic clergy too. Um, we have to have a better understanding. I'll tell you the difficulty. The major difficulty is um, in Oslo, we succeeded to turn the the outside leadership into an inside leadership. Today, the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian leadership is an inside leadership living in the West Bank and Gaza. And, um, and the main interest, the main interest is um, to bring about end of occupation and state building, which is all very good and makes it possible to reach. But the difficulty, um, the difficulty of German um, of the chairman of the PLO and President Abbas, or also of Arafat, but Arafat was different, of Abbas is that he repre represents one part of the Palestinian people while there are four parts. There is the, um, the people living in the West Bank and Gaza, which he rep really represents. He doesn't represent the Israeli-Palestinian Arabs. He doesn't present um, the diaspora in in, and he doesn't represent the Palestinians in the Arab countries. 
And whatever we touch, on whatever we touch, we, um, we had an agreement with Abbas on Israel, why Israel should be recognized as the state of the Jewish people. And the Palestinian Arabs from Israel came and said over our dead body and he retreated, he retracted on that. Um, we had almost an agreement on the right of return on the refugees. And, um, the, um, and the diaspora came and said, we cannot have this. And um, we almost had an agreement on Jerusalem. And on Jerusalem, the Arabs and the, the Palestinians and the Arab world, mainly in, in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and in Jordan, said this cannot be. So the difficult, the major difficulty is that um, how do you deal with these different parts of the, and on the, the Israeli, internal the, the internal, the internal the part. Table. How do you tell uh, the behind the table conflict? And we have something similar on the Israeli side. And we have to work with it, we have to deal with it, and I think we can deal with it. So perhaps a forward-looking question that expands the, kind of expands the scope a little bit, and then let's turn to questions for good, good luck, uh, questions from the audience. There's a powerful independent and inherent logic for an Israeli-Palestinian deal. Most of us think two states are the way to go. And it would, if it works, it would be a great benefit in and of itself. And yet, that's taking place in a complex region. And the region changes all the time. But at the moment, you have, uh, you have this potential confluence of interest among a lot of otherwise disparate parties. So some people would say, among militant Islamists, most represented by, let's call it, the Islamic State, ISIL, ISIS, IS, but others would say Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hezbollah, that group is opposed by Egypt, Jordan, the Saudis, and so forth, the kind of moderate Sunni states. Those groups are opposed, particularly IS, by Iran al and of course, the United States and Israel also oppose these groups. Now I'm mentioning those that larger picture because I'm curious about how you see the relationship, if any, between an Israeli-Palestinian negotiation and this broader context that seems to be roughly dividing into these um, areas of potential shared interest, hardly coalition, but shared interest. Uh, there are good news and there are bad news. Thank you, answer the question. Um, the good news is that um, Abbas, in order to move forward, uh, needs the legitimacy of Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the other countries. And Israel needs the security cooperation of these countries. So there is a potential concept that could work as long as it's not merely bilateral. There's also the good news that, for instance, on security issues we worked um, if you work on the security issues between Israel and Palestine, there's no way to, to, to bridge the gap between Israel's security needs on the Jordan Valley and other security needs against threats from the outside and, and Palestinian sovereignty needs. If you develop a structure that is Israeli-Palestinian-Jordanian, Israeli-Palestinian-Egyptian, and you develop it in the, in the security coordination concept, that according to the Israeli-Jordanian Israeli Treaty of Peace will lead to a Helsinki-like regional structure, there's a way to deal with it. So on, on security, uh, security issues, the regional part is extremely useful and we're actually talking about it and thinking about it. Um, on Jerusalem, on, on Jerusalem, um, uh, what I prepared in back channel negotiations for Olmert, um, the um, Palestinian side asked for, um, Olmert proposed um, a concept where there would be on the holy places a five power control system that only could work unanimously, which was Saudi Arabia, um, I think Saudi Arabia, Jordan, um, the Palestinians, United States and us. Um, so there, is quite a, there are things that are possible, um, it's complicated, but the, um, the Palestinian side 
said, I hope I'm go going to make people irritated by what I'm saying now. Um, the, um, the Palestinian side offered as a gesture to say it should be not only Israel, but the Jews from outside. And you have no idea how Chaim Ramon shouted at me and said, we have to take the decisions alone. We are happy to have good relations with the diaspora, but not in the decision-making process. <laughs> um, so yes, um, now it's difficult. It's difficult to put everything together. It's a, um, it's a classical negotiating process where you've got multi, many actors, and you know more better than I do how, how complicated this is to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. No, we revel in complexity. <laughs> I would uh, both like to thank you and turn things over to questions from the audience. And as is customary, we would strongly prefer brief questions, and question means ends with a question mark. <laughs> Statements are really not a good use of our time, which is to hear um, your really uh, youngers view on these things. So let us open it up. The state building that you're envisioning is the same one that started from the premise in Oslo 1 that uh, Palestinians would get 22% of the historical mandate Palestine and Israel would get 78% and went to Oslo 2, which would allow Israel to expropriate large portions of that small 22% that Palestinians originally started out with. So the kind of state... What's the question? The question is that the Oslo Accords were really the beginning of the apartheid system that Israel was imposed on the occupied territory. Okay. That enabled Israel then to control most of the occupied territories as well as the territories that they already possessed. So it started out from an unfair assumption and became more unfair as it proceeded. Okay. I, don't, I understand we will not come to an agreement with you. I don't have to come to an agreement with you but with the Palestinians. Um, now, on the 22%, I can argue the same way that if you look at historical Palestine, um, what will be Israel will be less than 20%, and Palestine and Jordan together will be more than 80%. So you playing with these percentages is not really, uh, really thing. You actually see that you have to take, you have to end occupation, and in a way that the state of Israel can be stable, can be secure, and the, um, we can live there in a decent manner. If you want, if you think that this is unfair, it's your problem. Question. Yes. Hi. Um, so when you were talking about the coalitions that you thought were necessary to uh, move forward in the peace process, I noticed that you didn't mention the United States. Um, I know the United States has been criticized for its inability to serve as sort of an honest broker, and I'm wondering <coughs> if you think that a space still exists for the U.S. to have a productive role in the conflict um, negotiations and what that should look like? Um, I think the United States is enormously important. And um, the United, uh, as an Israeli, the ally, to be, have the United States support Israeli major interests is a vital Israeli interest. Um, my sense is that things look differently if you look from Ramallah and Jerusalem or Tel Aviv to the west, or you look from Washington to the east. And um, my basic sense is that um, in Oslo, um, the Americans were not part of the negotiations. Um, but when we had an agreement, um, Paris flew to Santa Barbara um, and saw Warren Christopher, and the um, Americans were gentle and supportive enough to offer their full support for what we had agreed upon. And in many ways, this is a model I would like to repeat. Um, we have to inform the United States. From my point of view, and the, the decisive development will be in the next elections in Israel. And the next prime minister, the first thing to do, we have from now to the elections to work very closely together with the Palestinians to develop a basic guidelines of an understanding. And I think it's doable. Um, and the first thing the Palestinian um, president and Israeli prime minister should do after elections in Israel is to go to Washington and sign a memorandum of an agreement where we say what the contours of the peace process will be. And then American support and American assistance and putting together, the, the United States will put together the coalition, not we. 
then American support is, is invaluable. But in that order. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so immediately uh, after the most recent round of negotiations with the Kerry Initiative, uh, there was a very famous article that came out by a prominent journalist, Israeli journalist, Nahum Barnea, um, who essentially gave us an inside perspective of what happened in the negotiations. One of, it, one of the things that he mentioned was that uh, Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu cut a deal with the settler party, um, s exchanging essentially prisoners for more settlements um, and allowing the, the letting go of prisoners if there was allowed to be more settlements built. And so I guess my question is, at what point do negotiations become detrimental? If the negotiations form a certain uh, form a certain negative context in which settlements could be expanded. I, I unfortunately agree with the with the main message of the question. Um, negotiations can become detrimental. If negotiations are cover for um, settlement activity and things like this. They are disaster. Um, and uh, I do believe in negotiations, um, but I can few other, I, I quoted before that Mia Dagan who said, let's move ahead in, 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 in implementing things, have coordinated action that is agreed upon and move upon. Um, the answer is yes. Um, we have another question, but I'm, I won't go there because there's another question behind what you asked. What are your views on the differences between negotiating without us and negotiating without us? Um, Arafat was a um, mostly remarkable leader. Um, he had no real power behind him, he had no state power, no in, in, and he maintained his, leader, his unquestioned leadership from 1968 until he died. And he was a disaster. And I'll tell you a short story that gives you a little bit of the sense, but I'll tell a little more. In Oslo, we had the, um, the order from Rabin on economic issues, agree what the Palestinians want. Whatever they want, give it them. <laughs> and um, Abu Allah let Abu Kosh, Ambassador Abu Kosh, work with us, and Abu Kosh made help for us. And in the end, at the end we got so upset that the th he was sitting in the corner and we three of us surrounded him in a quite, quite threatening manner and said, you know, Ambassador Abu Kosh, we want to finish this and on, on, on economic issues, you're willing to go all along what you want, but tell, you, tell us what you want. And he almost started to cry. I said, you know, we don't want to upset you so much. We're telling you, tell us what you want. And he said, you don't understand. I have the order from Arafat to do exactly the opposite what Abu al is telling me. I mean, the, way, the means and ways that Arafat mentioned his uh, we, Oslo, had the, I was asked about one of the, fa there were four failures of Oslo. The major failure was that we wanted the PA to be a, a, a Medina Shabadere, the, the, the basic institutions of a state. Arafat would do everything to prevent it. For Arafat, the only thing that was decisive was Mr. Arafat and his power. He had three different kinds of constitutions. He was the head of the PLO, he was the head of Fatah, and he was the head of the PA. He had the he had the legis 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 legislative legislative thing, and uh, um, <coughs> he had the two different parts of it in all of these things, and they were all empty, and all the decisions were only made in his court. He had ten security organizations in the West Bank. He had ten in Gaza. He would play, one would cooperate with us, the other would kill us. He did everything to prevent the real state building structure. It was one of the major, face, major difficulties of Oslo. So, but otherwise, if you would get, if you would understand the, the, the difficult negotiations, and Barak didn't understand it, and we did understand it. The difficult, the, the positive side of negotiating with Arafat was, you had to know what was the deal-making issue at one state. The deal-making issue in Oslo was to get him back to Gaza. The deal-making issue in, nine, in 2000 was to have a municipality of Jerusalem established and let him get 
it was strong foothold in Jews. I mean, we could have got a lot of things in the temple, but Barak, Barak didn't understand that. And later we could have, uh, then he wanted to have a head of a state. The things that you had to know with Arafat what the deal maker was and go for it and cut off all the other options for him. But in that case, Arafat was easier to deal with. And Abbas, Abbas is, is a decent guy. Um, Abbas is, um, um, uh, but he's less, less powerful and... Certainly less charismatic too. Less charismatic, yes. <laughs> um, I'm the Phaedrusian was always skeptical uh, of where Oslo was going to take us. A little bit louder. I'm a Palestinian who was skeptical of where Oslo was going to take us, and uh, I share your views on Arafat. But I, for me, Oslo completely died when uh, Rabin was killed. What would you say about that? What should I say? Um, I feel both analytical, both empirical, and both emotional about that. Um, you, well, uh, I'm always asked a question which historians never answer and I will answer. What would have happened if our, our Rabin wouldn't have it tonight? The answer is we wouldn't have a full permanent status agreement, but we would have substantial movements towards a two-state solution because he had this partnership concept and he had this understanding how to, how to work together with our Um, um If you read Sari Nusebe, he tells us, you know, after, um, after Rabin was assassinated, uh, Hamas successfully killed enough Israelis to get Netanyahu on power. Sari Nusebe told me something else in 95. I write it in the book and I was terribly upset about it. He told me, he told me in May 95, Yair, yeah, if the Labour Party moves towards permanent status, you go too fast and you will create too much opposition and too much tension in the Palestinian structure and therefore it's better Likud is comes to power and they have you as a, the Palestinians have you as a safety network. And after, Nathan, when Netanyahu was still thing, I wrote a book with the, with the title Oslo Nuschal Le Shalom, Oslo a formula for peace and I was wrong. But my understanding was that if Netanyahu is, um, Netanyahu is Prime Minister, also there's the mess about the settlements, but we get one agreement after the other because we have a very intense dialogue with the Palestinians and we do manage things together. And then came Barak and broke it everything up. The real, real decis the decisive failure of, of, of Oslo is um, the Barak negotiations and the failure of 2000, 2001. Yes, sir. Uh, assuming that you've read Carolyn Wick's book, The Israeli Solution, I have three fast questions. Do you think her characterization of the motivations of the players is accurate? Do you think that the solution... I think she's a fascist idiot. <laughs> maybe, maybe I won't ask you any questions. <laughs> <laughs> she is a, a propagandist. Um, she has totally preceded preconceived pre conditions and she's the worst of Israeli propagandists I can imagine and I'm ashamed of her. I, mean, I assume this is mutual but, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but that's her right to... Yes, what was the name that you were saying? Mm. Yeah, about... Now, of the lady? Yeah. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Watch the video too. <laughs> I think that the last occasion, summer occasion, little bit louder. I think that the last summer occasion in the Middle East, in the Gaza Strip, proved us, proved us again that Hamas has a major part on the Palestinian uh, side. Do you think that Hamas should take an active part in the negotiation, not only behind the scenes? I have a very strong opinion on that. Unlike anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Did everybody hear the question? No. The, 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 the question was that given that Hamas has demonstrated that it's a, a potent political actor uh, uh, with the Palestinian people, should it have a formal role in the negotiations? 
I think it would be a disaster if Israel negotiates with the, with the PLO and at the same time negotiates with Hamas. I think it would be a disaster if we would negotiate with Hamas instead of the PLO. Um, that, and I'm very, very clear about this. Um, it doesn't mean that I think that a certain dialogue with the Hamas is not good for Let me ask a follow-up question. Uh, mm. And that is, uh, Netanyahu conspicuously condemned the, the quote, rec I put it in quotes, the reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas within the Palestinian uh, authority and uh, was refusing thereafter to negotiate with the PA if it included Hamas, would that be a mistake? Um, I, I believe, and I can speak about the Israeli Minister of Defense, not 100% of our Prime Minister. Um, the position of the Israeli government largely changed on this during the war. Um, during the war, um, the Israeli even the Prime Minister, but definitely the Minister of Defense, understands that the unity government as it is, is not a unity government, but a consensus government. And the consensus government is necessary to permit the PA to play a leading role in Gaza. And this is more or less agreed upon. If we should speak to Hamas, um, the answer, I can tell you personally, I speak a lot to the Palestinian leadership in, Ram in Ramallah, if I would speak to Hamas, they would throw me out of the window. And I'm not going to be thrown out of the window for, speak for the pleasure of speaking to Hamas. There may be things I'm willing to, um, but not for this. Um, now, there, there, has to be, um, there has to be a process to integrate Hamas into the system. But it has to go by a preventing rearmament and demilitarization. And today, Abbas is demanding very, very strictly, except one authority, one law, one gun. And we'll have to see how to work this out. It will not be without hardball playing on both sides. So you would say, negotiate with the Palestinian Authority, do a deal, strengthen that axis, and then integrate Hamas, but no central role Perhaps a, a very low-key informal role, but nothing more. Yes, that, okay. exactly. But the post was a very low-key informal. Very low. -key. Yes. <laughs> and you didn't actually say that. No. Okay. No. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, Carl, I'm sorry, you were going to ask that. You asked the question. Oh. Um, two of the points on the six-point test were where do nationally. Again, please, a little bit louder. Oh, sorry. Two of your points on your six-point test was where do national interests merge and lessons learned from former failures? Could you expand on those two points? Uh, lessons learned from former failures are, are decisive. And, um, and I can take you through many, many examples in many conflict situations where this is very decisive. And sometimes the wrong lessons are learned, but normally the lessons learning, normally the discussions if, you, if the Minister of Foreign Affairs or the Prime Minister speaks to you, most of the discussions are related to what are the lessons learned from former experiences, the argument. It, it is the most, the most important policy instrument that like, two or back channel negotiators have in order to convince the, the leadership. Um, um, I can give you on each of the lessons learned. Um, I can take you back when, uh, I'll, I'll take you back to 1956. Um, in 1956, the Soviet Union threatened Israel with a nuclear war. And what Ben-Gurion said, the Bulgarian letter was the letter of a criminal. But he, after it came, immediately agreed on unilateral withdrawal, without conditions, almost without conditions. <coughs> a little bit more complicated. In 1967, there was a replay. And in 1967, um, the Palestinians threatened is the Russians, not the Palestinians, the Russians again used very, very powerful language. I can go into details, but um, somebody, I, 
I admired was the head of Mapam Chazan, Yaakov Chazan, and I, my, I don't want to go, my, my, my father had a, had a romantic relationship who afterwards, the lady who became his wife, but so it doesn't really belong there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I, I, I adored him. He was the leader of the movement I belonged to. And, um, and I was happy he, he, it was him who married that lady, but not my long father, but that's another issue. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, but the, she, Khazan had a meeting with the um, Soviet ambassador on the 1st of June, 67, and the Soviet ambassador told him, um, Israel will not exist in three more, in three more months. We will, it will be exploded. Not important what Khazan's answer was. Um, the logic in 1967 was that we won the decision by the unilateral withdrawal without conditions of first negotiations and then it. We learned the lesson and the United States learned the lesson and therefore it was possible after 67 not to withdraw but to ask for for negotiations. It was an outcome of the lessons learned from 56. And I can go on and on in these issues. Um, there was... Um, the Israeli position um, until 1973 was um, nothing that every single nothing. And when 1973 came, we saw it didn't work, and we went for the step by step approach. Um, so you always learn from the mistakes of, your, of what you did, for, and it is extremely important. And I believe, um, you know, um, um, I had an, another experience which which I write in the book, in, um, under Olmert, before Olmert negotiated, um, he asked David Baudet and me to find the terms of reference, terms of reference for an agreement um, for the Annapolis Conference. And um, in July 2007, our Palestinian partners wrote a paper, and it was totally rejected by Olmert and by Chaim Ramon and Zippy Livni. And then Olmert negotiated the, and made a presentation, and if you would take Olmert's proposal of 2008 and compare it with the Palestinian guideline paper of 2007, it fitted totally one the other. And the lesson learned was terrible. The lesson learned was if you want to have terms of reference, which Secretary of State wanted to have, um, and agree on terms of reference, the Israeli side needs maneuvering place for negotiations and will not agree to narrowing down terms of reference. When we turn even narrowing down terms of reference into something the Israeli state proposes, it is very difficult for the Palestinian side to accept. Therefore, we told the Americans, Kerry, before, one of the lessons that he could have learned was don't go for a framework of agreement. The framework of agreement will not fit. It will not work. You have to look at something else. So lessons can be learned, lessons cannot be learned, but they should be learned. <laughs> they should be learned. <laughs> what you've just demonstrated is that uh, we're always, uh, people are always fighting the last war. Yeah. Institutions are always hiring a new president, a new leader who's not like the old one because they're quite aware of what the faults of the old one are. And, uh, and, and in fact, the difficulty is, as a historian, you know this, there are lots of lessons from the past in which one you're looking at. Sure. So it's interesting. I think the two lessons I hear unequivocally are you know, a full-on, full-blown final status objective in a near term is a fool's error. And the second that I hear is in response to an earlier question about potential American involvement, the idea, a seductive idea that's often proposed is that the Americans put something on the table that the two sides are too far apart and it's too politically difficult either to propose anything, so a function of a mediator should be to do that. And I hear you saying that's pretty dangerous. Let me ask you a, 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 a sort of a different a question. It's people who work close to the issue are very familiar with what I'm going to say, but some, some less so. Uh, there, for the last, uh, I believe, roughly decade, there have been various incarnations of something called the Arab Peace Initiative, which was an initiative of the King of Saudi Arabia, later adopted by the Arab League, which in concept would have a deal with the Palestinians leading to recognition of Israel by 22 Arab countries, much the same as Egypt and Jordan had already done. And on its face, 
this would not be, the terms of the Air Peace Initiative would not be acceptable. And yet, as a, as a, as a concept for negotiation, many people thought this would be very attractive relative to a pure Palestinian settlement. Could you talk about that, the Arab Peace Initiative, as an approach? What's good about it? What's bad about it? Is there any potential role for that in strengthening, for example, what you characterize as a relatively weak Palestinian leader to have the legitimacy of this much larger concept? I'll start what is bad about it, and then what is good about it, and what good. What is bad about it originally, not necessarily now, um, is that it um, makes very clear demands from Israel on back to the June 4, 67 line, a Palestinian state, Jerusalem as the capital, right, right of return according to agreement. Um, it's very strict on the demands from Israel, and it promises something very good in return after we've done everything. And no Israeli government can accept um, a vague promise of goodies after you've done everything. Uh, we've discussed this with the Saudis, we've discussed this with the Egyptians, we've discussed this with the Jordanians and with the Palestinians. And there's willingness on their side uh, now uh, to what we call operationalize the Arab Peace Initiative. Um, and um, uh, and th th there's quite a lot of thinking going on on that. Um, uh, well, what we are saying is um, the first, first of all, um, the um, Arab Peace Initiative are principles. They don't come instead of Israeli-Palestinian, Israeli-Syrian, or Israeli negotiations. Now, it speaks about peace with Syria. Peace with Syria is quite complicated at the moment, and not the most practical thing we can do. Uh, also, we have there are certain things that have to be prevented, but you know, there's no government we can negotiate with. Um, the, um, uh, we are saying that the Arab, there is, there is an Egyptian, the Arab League has established an Egyptian um, Jordanian Minister for Foreign Affairs to come to us and work on the Arab Peace Initiative, how to do it. And I think this is extremely important. And when we go to the next elections, this will be an issue that we will dis discuss. Um, we are telling the Egyptians, the Jordanians, the Saudis, um, the Egyptian, the uh, Arab Peace Initiative should first take a major role in building the Palestinian state, in the Palestinian state building issue, uh, in, in, in investing, in financing, now, if they do it, it has a quid pro quo for Israel. But if you, um, for instance, build an independent Palestinian electricity network, if you want it or not, you connect the Israeli, Israeli electricity network with Palestine, with Jordan, with Egypt. By, by definition, it doesn't work otherwise. And this is a road system, and this is all the other things. So, it, the, so what we are talking about is we want you to in, invest in Palestinian state building and doing it. We want to develop a security coordination system which anyhow is necessary. But we understand that we have to relate negotiations to the Arab Peace Initiative and go along with it. The Saudis are demanding from us a complete acceptance of um, the Arab Peace Initiative up, on up front. Um, we have discussed with them to have what we call a, zip, um, a zipper. And present, no, not anymore, but Paris, when he was president, which is not so long ago, started to make um, um, first statements. And Faisal Turki, Prince Faisal, Faisal, Prince Turkil Faisal, started to make some other things. Um, it has been stopped in the meantime, but it is definitely important to relate to the Arab Peace Initiative. Now, one more thing on the Arab Peace Initiative: it is mentioned very clearly in the roadmap, and the Israeli government has accepted the roadmap. So it is an important component in the wider structure to work on. Well, uh, thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions, but I think... I'm sorry? I have one more question. Uh, no, I have a question over here, too, but it's 1.32.
and I think we had promised to end at 1.30. I think uh, uh, Dr. Hirschfeld will, will st stick around for a couple minutes, and we've got books for those uh, who want to get a book, and he perhaps would even autograph it. And I want to thank all of you for coming.